Good morning, everybody. This is the Macro Church of Christ uh, worship service. We're glad that you're here today. Pray that the Lord blesses you for being here with us as we take a look. Uh, let me give you some announcements that to be made. Uh, general, keep Elaine in your prayers, and those people mentioned in our bulletin as needing prayers. Uh, there will be a, a servants meeting today. That's the elders, uh, preachers, and deacons will be meeting. Uh, we, we all hope that you're doing your Bible reading. Uh, it was funny, this uh, yesterday I happened to go get some sandwiches at Bel Air, and the guy who was helping me was a, a young fellow, I got to talk with him, and uh, he told me that he just kind of started going to church and was wanted to read his Bible, and so I told him about the, the Bible app, and he goes, really? That's so exciting! So, you know, he's, he's going to start reading. So we hope that you all, you all are doing your reading, because we think it's really important. Uh, ladies' Fellowship is today, right after service, if you don't know what that's about, see Linda, should be happy to fill you in on that. Uh, and then we're going to have a servant's report next Sunday. This is a five-Sunday month, and on the fourth Sunday of the fifth Sunday month, we have our servant's report. So we're going to be uh, letting you guys know what's going on as far as the congregation. We hope you hang around for a few minutes. We'll try to make it as quick as possible. Oh, the other thing is Brother Don is sick. Uh, he's not feeling well, and uh, he thinks he might have a touch of pneumonia or some bronchitis or something. And so he's home. Uh, you can ask Rebecca about him. She's here, but he's not feeling well. So keep him in your prayers if you would. Um, so uh, I don't see Elaine or Don here, so I'm not sure whether you guys are meeting uh, remotely or anything for those that are in the fundamental men's and ladies' meetings, uh, but you might check with that. Uh, those are the announcements that I know of that we need to remember. Uh, other than that, we hope that you're all doing well. For those of you that are watching this online, we pray that you would someday be able to come and visit with us or at least to start attending with us so that we can uh, together greet one another, encourage one another, uh, because that's what we want to do. Uh, when Lee and Karen were gone, we missed them being here with us, and now they're back with us, and so we're glad they're here. And we appreciate all of you who, who, uh, who attend, uh, where we can sing together and praise God together and glorify his name. If you are watching this on, uh, online at, or at home and you need communion um, containers, the little communion cups with the bread, let us know and we'll be happy to get those to you. Uh, but we hope that uh, you'll be able to meet with us soon. Good morning, everybody, and it's good to see you all. Glad the Lord's blessed you. Glad the Lord has uh, been taking care of you and providing for you. Uh, as long as he has, and we continue, we pray that he continues to do that. Uh, there will be a uh, we worship today uh, for those children that are between the age of three and eight. I know Brother uh, Sandy is back there, uh, and he's getting things prepared for them because they're going to be talking about lost sheep. So if you happen to see a lost sheep walking around in here, make sure it's sent it home. Don't you love the picture of that sheep, though? You know that's kind of the way I look when I feel like I'm lost. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and so we, we really appreciate Sandy and the work that he does, and uh, especially with the children. And, and we see a difference in those children that are brought up believing in God, and and from from the time they're young to those people to those children who aren't. There's a, a major difference in the way they act and the way they treat people and in their respect level. So we really appreciate Sandy doing that for us. But remember that it's not his job; it's our job as parents and grandparents to make sure that we're raising our children in accordance with what God says, and we appreciate Sandy helping us in that endeavor. So we're going to be singing a song, Brother uh, Bill's going to be leading us in song since Don isn't feeling well, and so we want everybody to sit up straight, and let's uh, praise God together as we sing number four, uh, Blessed Assurance. And like I said, it's getting crowded. <laughs> Good morning. Morning. I am so happy to be back. I want to personally thank each and every one of you for your prayers, your card calls. Uh, February was a rough month at the Wingmore household. We're glad you're back. And I'm glad to be here. Uh, You ever, hit, ever hear anybody say, that's a story of my life? And it's usually when something negative happens. That's the story of my life. And I'm here to, re to make a rebuttal for that. That is not the story of your life. The story of your life we'll be singing about in this song. <coughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. 
heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Knows and hears 
thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name. Long before the Lord's Supper, help the prayer of mine. Page 166. Sheep going astray, 
but now we have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. Amen. 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 Let us we remember the Lord's suffering and we remember the Lord's um, gift to us this day. We want to remember how dear it is that if we are rejoicing in Christ now, it is because he suffered for us. If there is anything we could even be proud of in our life, maybe avoiding troubles because you know Christ, or maybe doing the right thing that um, saved you in one way or the other because you know Christ, is still through him. Or if we also suffer for him or for his sake, we endure many things that the world will throw at us, it is also to give praise to him. And therefore, we remember his suffering. The Bible says that he took our punishment in his body. Therefore, we want to pray over the body, even as we remember his suffering for us. Shall we pray? Our dear Lord, we can't thank you enough. There is nothing that we can do to appreciate enough. Our everyday O Lord should be and is an expression of our thanksgiving to you. We are so much grateful that without you, we are nothing, and we cannot live without you. We thank you for the punishment that was taken for us. We thank you that every now and then, oh Lord, we can look back to that punishment and have assurance that indeed, we are still not there as we're supposed to, or we have had a bad past life, but you, oh Lord, have canceled it through Christ Jesus. We thank you for this. Even as we remember our Lord's suffering. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
little bit of the song before our lesson, or before our memory exercise. Uh, if you're able, and you would care to please stand with me while we sing. Hebrews, and there would be 14, 
And you might remember that because it's seven twice. And seven is, you know, how many days you have in a week or the perfect number in the Bible. Uh, and then that would give you seven or eight uh, books that were written by somebody else. But I'd suggest to you seven because uh, Revelation is really a book of prophecy. Now, one thing to remember in these, in these books here, the names here are the names to whom they are written to by Paul. And these over here, the names are the people who wrote the book. So that might help you a little bit in understanding those things. Now, you have some uh, memory work that we want to remember. You have Colossians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, uh, which is, Therefore, uh, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things of the earth. And I know some of these are, are a little bit more challenging for us, but, you know, it's good to keep our gray matter working as much as we can. There's Micah 6 and verse 8. When he says, he has told you, O man, uh, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And then you have Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God for salvation. Everybody who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then you have 2 Timothy 2.15, which is the one that we have today. Although in your, in your um, uh, bulletin... It's actually, oh, what is it in the bulletin? In the bulletin, it's different. That's, that's because Bill and, I got mixed, Bill and I got mixed up on, on what uh, passage John gave us. But you're going to have either, you're going to have both of these, so next week we'll have the other one. So you have 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, which says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed and handling accurately the word of truth. And so those are the... The, the, the memory work that we want you to remember. Uh, and so you might want to write this one down, although this one is on the back of your sermon outline. So you look at the sermon outline, it has this one, and then the bulletin has the one that you're going to be doing next week. So we'll be switching those for you. All right, and our reading today is Job 39. Hello, beloved. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I thought he was going to sit down. But no, he's <laughs> you're you're good to look. Yeah. Eventually, it'll, it'll work, right? Um, it's always nice to be up here and read um, in front of the congregation. Thank you. Um, so today, we're going to take a little journey into the book of Job, uh, chapter 39, verses 13 to 30. The ostrich's wings flap uh, joyously with the pinion and plumage of love, for she abandons her eggs to the earth and warms them in the dust. And she forgets that a foot may crush them. And she forgets that a, f a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may trample them. She treats her young cruelly as if they were not hers. Though her labor uh, be in vain, she is uh, unconcerned because God has made her forget wisdom and has not given her a share of understanding. When she lifts herself on high, she laughs at the horse and its rider. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a, a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His, majesty, his majestic uh, snorting uh, is, is terrible. He paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and not dismayed. And he does not turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles uh, against him, the flashing spear and javelin. With shaking and rage, he races over the ground, and he does not stand still at the voice of the trumpet. As often as the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! And he sends the battle from afar, and the thunder of the captains and the war cry. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching his wings towards the south, is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the cliff he dwells and lodges, upon the rocky crag, an inaccessible place. From there he spies out uh, food. His eyes see it from afar. His young ones also uh, suck, by blood, suck up blood, and where the, the slain are, there he is. You have 
children, you might take them to WeWorks for this time if you'd like them to go. Brother Sandy's going to be back there waiting for them. Good to see you all here. Glad you're here with us. And if you're visiting with us, uh, notice that your outline has some blank spaces. Those blank spaces are underlined on the overhead. You can write those down. Most people already know that. So let's get into what we're talking about today. And that is, do you believe that God created sentient life? And we're going to be talking about that. And we're going to be trying to figure out what that means. But I want to remind you of some things as we begin to do this. I want to remind you of the first four days of creation. You have uh, the statement in Genesis 1-1 that's basically just a summary statement. that says God created the world and, the, and the, the world was void and formless. And then in day one, God created light. In day two, God created our environment and space. In day three, then God created uh, land and seas. And today we're going to, and in day four, he created the luminaries of the stars and the, and the sun. And we talked about that last week. If you missed any of those, make sure and uh, pick those up and watch them on YouTube if you'd like to. Some things to remember as we get into this. Remember that from man, for man, the physical is first and the spiritual. So all of these things we're going to be talking about, I believe, have a spiritual connection to them or point us to something spiritual. I just want to remind you of that. And we're also talking about a pre-flood world. So as we talk about these things, we're talking about a pre-flood world and a pre-sin world, which was different than the world that we have now. Also, I want you to remember that the Bible doesn't contradict science. But science examines the knowable while God tells us the unknowable without contradicting the knowable. And that's your memory verse, Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the things that we can't see, like we weren't there in creation, we can't see heaven, we can't see hell, those kinds of things, we have to rely on God and what God's word tells us in order to believe those things. So as we get ready to take a look at this idea of sentient life is on earth, or at least I think it is, uh, because I think we think, right? And like that guy once said, uh, I think I am, so therefore I am, I am right? So there's, there's sentient life here on the earth. In Genesis 1 and verse 20 it says, Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. But just exactly what does sentient life mean? What do we mean by that? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 11 gives us a hint, although we could pick a number of different verses, even the ones that were read to us by Steve. But in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 11, it says, Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spreads his wings and caught them, he carried them on his pin pinions. So here you have the picture of an eagle who's hovering over its, its nest and taking care of its, of its chicks that are in there, and it, it's doing that because it is sentient. And sentient, in a simple definition, just simply means this. Simply put, sentient means the ability to have feelings. It's the, it's the capacity to experience sensation and emotion. So that's what makes sentient life different than plant life. We talked about plant life uh, on the third day, but here we're talking about sentient life. Here, here we're talking about life that feels, that moves, that does things like the eagle flying over its nest when he sees the nest and what needs to be done. And so that's what we mean by sentient life. And as we think about that, plants, as we mentioned, have life, but it's not sentient. In Genesis 1, and verse 11 through 13, it says, God said that the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind, and seed in them, and it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and, and the trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning a third day. And so there, God had life, but it wasn't what we would call sentient life. Uh, it didn't cry, it didn't weep, it, didn't, it, didn't, it wasn't happy. Uh, you can certainly have a happy plant by the fact that it looks nice and green, uh, or at least we say it's a happy plant, but we never hear it laugh, we don't hear it giggle, there, there's, there's nothing that we can look at that makes us think that it's happy. So it's not really sentient. Uh, but how did sentient life get here? How did it start? And so let me suggest to you, I'm going to suggest to you four different uh, ideas on how sentient life got here. The first three are explained really without God. And I'll explain that to you as we get to them. So one of the ways is that somebody says it's by chance. And those are people who in, Philipp in Psalms 41 and 14 and verse 1, they don't believe in God. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. 
they've committed abominable deeds, and there is no and uh, uh, there is uh, no one who does good. So those people who believe that you're here by chance, that you're here by just some cosmic event that happened uh, when the earth had just exactly enough water on it and there was just exactly enough heat and there was exactly enough minerals or, or, or non-animate material that somehow clung together and formed into this one little animal, this one little um, whatever it is that they say started off and then that developed into you and I. And so those people are the ones who say life got here by chance, and that would be the evolutionists. Those people who believe in evolution and believe that that's how we started, that we're just here by chance, there's no purpose, there's no reason, we just kind of are lucky if you think it's lucky to be here. The second group is what we might call, or what's been called, panspermia. And basically what that means is that these are people who can see that there is some design and order in our world. In Romans 1 and verse 25, it says, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. So these are people who can see some design in our world, and they look at the world and they go, How could that life have gotten here? And so what they say is, there's a number of different ways that this is, is brought about. There's some who believe that billions and millions and trillions of years ago, whatever, however long it was, that somehow there was life on this planet somewhere and that through some cosmic explosion that planet kind of tore apart and we got a piece of it on Earth and that piece on Earth then started life. And so they'll say that's how life got here. That, that's one extreme. The other extreme is that there were extraterrestrial aliens out in, in, in the world, in, the, our, in our universe, and they came and they seeded our world with with what we need in order for our world to have sentient life. And so you got those two extremes uh, in that, and that's why it's named that. The third group are those people who believe in what's called intelligent design, and like the, like the first one, they're a little different. That is in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And in Psalms 139 and verse 13, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was, hid was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depth of the earth. And so the... The intelligent design people say there's intelligence, there's design in the world, so some, somebody had, had to do it. And so probably it was some space aliens that came, and they came over and they dropped a little bit of DNA in our oceans at exactly the right time, and then that developed into different things. I don't know if any of you like sci-fi movies, but if you happen to see um, Prometheus, uh, that, that's the whole premise of that, of that movie. That some aliens came and they dropped a little bit of, of DNA inside our, 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 our oceans and then that created life and that life started. And so these are individuals who can see that there seems to be design in our world and they don't believe that it just randomly happened, but they don't really want to believe in God. And so that's those intelligent design people. Uh, now, and then there's, of course, those that believe what we do, and that is in creation. And certainly it's intelligently designed by God, so I don't want to say it's not, but it, it is. But God's the one who designed it. God's the one who did it. He told us how he did it. In Psalms 103, it says, Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and that we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So the Bible tells us that God is the one who made us. God's the one who created. He's the one who created sentient life on this world and on this planet. So Bible faith says God created sentient life on the fifth day. Genesis 1 and verse 20, it says, Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the, the earth in the open expanse of heaven. And so God, it says that God created what you and I would call sentient life. It's the life that has feelings. Now, sentient life in the Bible has a soul. Sometimes people ask, Do animals have a soul? And the answer is, well, it depends on how you mean that. Now, let me explain that for you for just a second. One of the problems is that we have two words in our, in our biblical language that sometimes we get confused. And a matter of fact, sometimes they're even used, to, to, they're e e even used interchangeably. And that's the word soul and the word spirit. 
So you have a soul, and, and you say, well, does an animal have a soul or does it have a spirit? You know, which of the two does it have? Well, here's what you need to remember. The word spirit means breath. The word soul, you might say, means life. In Psalm 74, in verse 19, it says, Do not deliver the soul of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your afflicted forever. And remember, this is poetry. And in Hebrew poetry, it doesn't rhyme in sound. It rhymes in thought. So the rhyming that you have here is the word soul equals life, and the word turtle dove equals afflicted. And so that's the poetry that you have in the Old Testament. So those five books of poetry that we look at, when you look, look at them and you go, they don't rhyme. That's English poetry. That's American poetry. Hebrew poetry, they rhyme in thought. They rhyme in, in, in concepts. Like here, do not deliver the soul of the turtle dove to the wild means the same thing as do not forget the life of your afflicted forever. And so what he tells us is that the word soul means life. And I suggest to you that the simple way of thinking about an animal is that an animal has life, has sentient life. And that sentient life is given to it by God. And so I suggest that to you. But man, however, is more than sentient life. And we'll talk more about this when we get to the sixth day of creation, which is coming up next week. But what I want you to understand is that man is more than just sentient life. Man is more than just somebody who, re, who, who can have emotions and can, can react to its, in, his environment. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23, it says this as Paul is commending the Thessalonians. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here you have the soul and the spirit separated. And that suggests to you that the reason why those words are difficult to understand in our Bible is because sometimes when, when God uses the word soul for people, he's also including the spirit. Because if you're alive as a person, you have a spirit with you. And sometimes he uses the word spirit and he's talking about being alive. And that's why it's sometimes difficult for us to, to understand. So the simple way that I understand it, and maybe it's not right, but here's the way I understand it. The soul is the fact that you and I live, that we are animated, just like the animals. So from that standpoint, I'm animated, just like the, the cats are animated, the dogs are animated, the monkeys are animated. And that's, maybe that's why I'm a, a monkey's uncle. But <laughs> the, the, the fact is that those, those animals are animated. You and I have animation or we have life. But he also says that we have a spirit. There's something unique about human beings that is different than all of other God's creations. And like I said, we're going to speak about that a little bit later. But in Genesis 1 and verse 26, he gives us a hint. He says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God says that you and I are unique and different from just sentient life. We're different from a dog, we're different from a whale, and we're different from, from the little bitty animals that you can think of. There's something different about us. We're not here by chance. We're not here without design. God made us this way, and God made us this way for a purpose. But all sentient life has a soul and a body. All sentient life has those two components. It has a physical body, and it has animation, it has life that's given to that physical body. If that body doesn't have any animation to it, we call it dead. And that's the problem that science has to deal with. Science has to figure out how to take dead matter and make it sentient. God, uh, say, uh, uh, science has to figure out how, how that dead matter, what, how, are they, how are they want to say it got here, how that dead matter all of a sudden became to where it can think, laugh, cry, be sad, depressed, happy. They have to figure out how that happened. They might be able to figure out how some of these, some of these um, um, enzymes might have got together, but that doesn't make them happy. That doesn't make them sad. It doesn't make a person. So sentient life is what we're talking about when we're talking about God creating things. That's why in Ecclesiastes 3, and verse 19 and 20, it says, for the fate of the Son of Man and the fate of beasts is the same. Now, here's what I want you to remember. Ecclesiastes is a book that's written about people who think there is, no, there is nothing over the sun. In other words, there's no God. 
if we, if we didn't believe that there was a God and we just looked around the world and tried to figure out how it worked, here's what we would come up with. He says, for the fate of the Son of Man and the fate of the beast is the same. When a dog dies and you die, it looks the same, right? You're both dead. From our world, from our perspective, when a dog dies and a person dies, it looks exactly the same. They might die differently, but it looks exactly the same. He says, as one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they, are all, they all have the same breath, that would be life or animation, and there is no advantage for man over beast for all his vanity. And some people say, well, see, there's no difference between me and a dog. We have to remember, this is under the sun. This is people who don't believe there's a God. That's why Ecclesiastes is written. That's why, it, that's why he uses this expression a lot when he says they, are all, they all have the same breath and there is no ad ad advantage for man or a beast. All is vanity. See, from a worldly perspective, our life looks vain. And you might say, what do you mean it looks vain? I'm having a good time. Yeah, but you're going to die. What good did all your, your hard work do for you? What good did it do for you to get a house? What good did it do for you to build a business? What good did it do for you for all your vacations that you went on? If you're going to die, you're going to be dead. What good did it do you? So life is vain if you simply look at it from an under-the-world perspective. And I want to suggest something to you. I really believe that's the reason why our young people are having so much trouble today. Because they believe they're just simply living under the S-O, uh, the S-U-N and not the S-O-N. They don't understand that, 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 that there is a purpose for them being here. There is a design for them being here. There is the way, the way that God made them and the way that God intended for them, for them to be and a way for them to act in which they will be blessed and enjoy life and everything that they do and everything around them. And he says in verse 20, all go to the same place, all come from the dust, and all return to the dust. Now when he says they all go to the same place, that's from an under the sun perspective. Where do, when, you, when your dog dies, what do you do with him? You bury him, right? When, you're, when your uh, uh, mother-in-law dies, what do you do with her? You cremate her and you put her on yourself. <laughs> that's where my mother-in-law is. She's on, our, she's on one of our tables at home. But the point is, they die. And you bury them. That's what, They all go to the same place from an under-the-sun perspective. That's what, you, that's what I want you to understand. But all sentient life has a body and is animated somehow, in some way, by God, as he says that. Now, though sentient, they, animals, are governed by instinct. Now, I know this might make some of you upset. And I'm not meaning to make you upset because we had, when we were growing up, a number of different kinds of pets. We had cats. We had rats. Uh, we had, um, um, uh, I think we had some guinea pig or, or uh, we have a dog. Uh, we, we had some uh, little rodents when my kid, the kids were little. But here's what I want you to understand about all. And we loved them. You know, we took care of them. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, where Peter is writing about people who are worldly and people who are not supposed to be worldly, he uses this expression in verse 12. He says, but these, the, the wicked people, but these like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in, in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. So he says here that animals are born creatures of instinct. We had, we had our, our daughter's dog. We were, we were dog watching for the, for the last uh, three days. And that dog loves balls. Especially tennis balls. And you take the ball and you put it on the ground and you say, go get the ball. And she'll get the ball and she'll come and she'll put it on your lap. And she's waiting for you to go up throw, throw it out there. Yeah. She pretty much does it by instinct. I mean, you know, that's, that's what she does. Animals are governed by instinct. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not sentient. Remember what sentient means. They have emotions. They, they seem to, to moan and cry. Uh, matter of fact, our, our dog... Uh, our daughter's dog, whose name is Tucker. Uh, my wife always goes to bed before I do. And 
she's really an animal person, and I just love her, so that's the way that goes. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, the dog was upstairs, and, and, and she was laying down, and the dog was laying beside her on my side of the bed. <laughs> and we keep our door kind of closed, and it's, it's dark in there. So I open the door, and all of a sudden the dog raises his head and goes, Arr! <laughs> And I go, Tucker, and he goes, oh. <laughs> now, why did he do that? Instinct. That's why he did it. He did it by instinct. Right? So animals are governed by instinct. Now, it doesn't mean they don't love you. It doesn't mean they don't, you know, but like, as far as I'm concerned, you are gods to your dogs. Okay? Your dogs are happy to see you whenever you come home. Period. Okay? But instinct defined, is defined like this. An innate typically fixed pattern of behavior in animals in response to certain stimuli. So that's what instinct means. Instinct is, is innate. Now, you, you know what innate means? Innate means it's built into them. It's, it, it's, it's engineered into them. Okay. So, one of the problems with evolution is they have to figure out how did that get engineered into him? How did that happen? Now, for you and I who believe in God, it's not a problem. Why is it a problem? Because we know God. Because God could engineer it like that. God could design it like that. See, it's so much simpler, and, and you need less blind faith to believe in God, and that God created the world, than you do in evolution. And I really, I really hope that we understand that, and we teach our children that. So... Examples of instinct. That's why Brother Steve read for us that section that he read that had to do with ostriches and horses and eagles. Okay? Did you notice in that reading, in Job 39, that when he was reading about the ostrich, haven't you ever thought that kind of strange? What, how an ostrich raises its young? Do you know how an ostrich raises its young? First of all, they're kind of out in the wilderness and in warm areas, warm climates, very warm. And you remember that, that ostriches are flightless birds. Yeah. So I don't know whether we should put them in this section they were dealing with or next week, but either way. <laughs> what I want you to understand is, isn't it weird that you have this giant bird who lays its egg and drops it in the middle of nowhere and then leaves it? Yeah. It leaves it. And then you have other little birds like the kill deer, which, by the way, I know Brother Bill has some, has some kill deer around his house. This little kill deer is a small little bird, and he lays his, his, his uh, egg in the middle of pebbles because it kind of looks like a pebble. And he kind of hangs around it all the time there. And if he sees, like, a cat or a dog comes, the, the kill deer goes down and flies because he, he wants to make sure that that dog or that, that cat doesn't get his little egg down there. Not the ostrich. He just lays this egg in the middle of the dirt and walks off. Who in the world would, who in the world would do that? Now, I want you to think of evolution for just a minute. Let's say that some bird decided to start doing that. He lays an egg. What's going to happen when somebody takes that egg? No more evolution. Not only that, but the ostrich egg... It's really, really thick. It's not like your hen eggs that you get at the store where you crack and you break them, you know? It's thick. You know why it's thick? Because God said it's going to be sitting by itself in the desert and I want to give him a chance of survival. That's why he did that. That's why, that's why it says in Job chapter 39 and down here at verse 13, he says, The ostrich flaps its wings joyously with opinions and plumage of love, for she abandons her eggs in the earth and warms them in the dust, and she forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may trample them. She, thre uh, uh, she treats her youngs cruelly as if they were not hers, though her, though her labor be in vain. She is unconcerned. You know, the first one we read was about the eagle that hovers over its nest and makes sure everything's okay. And then you got this ostrich over here. <laughs> now, why don't you get an ostrich every once in a while that goes, oh, you know what, I'm going to change this. I'm going to hover over mine and make sure it's okay. 
Because it's by instinct. And who put that in there? God did. And have you ever noticed that in, in cowboy movies and in knight movies, you know, where they have uh, uh, knights in shining armor, they always ride horses, right? And they're riding these horses, and they're running into battle. You got these swords in front of them, they got cannons going off, and yet the horse runs? On the 4th of July, I know some dogs, they go crazy. But a horse will run into battle. Why does it do that? Why doesn't it act like the other animals and run away? And the eagle. Why does it build its nest so high up? And not only that, but how does it know when it comes out of the egg that it's supposed to build its nest so high? And my favorite, my favorite picture of instinct is a monarch butterfly. I love those little guys. You, you see them flying around your garden every so often, right? Do you know that it takes three generations for those monarch butterflies to fly their migratory route from Mexico, Michoacan, Mexico, all the way up to Canada? It takes three generations. In other words, they start off in Mexico. One generation comes to around Texas and Kansas. Another generation then is born and flies over to, to Canada. And then a the third generation is born and flies all the way back down over there. And my question is, how did they tell the generations when to fly and where to go? <laughs> how do they know that? How do they, how, maybe, maybe the teenage generation will say, I don't want to go to Mitchell Park. I can't even speak Spanish. Why do I want to go? But they don't. Every single third year, the monarch butterflies migrate from Michoacan, Mexico, all the way up to Canada, and all the way back, and they end up in the exact same forest in Michoacan, Mexico. How do they do that? Because God created them. See, even those people that believe in, in intellectual design understand that things like that, you're not going to get that by chance. Somebody had to, to design it. So because they don't believe in God, they have to think of aliens coming down, or they have to think of some other way that it was done in order for that to happen. But you and I know who the real alien is. It's God. So let me show you a little video about some birds and some fish that have to do with instinct. Can you see that? Yep. That's a salmon trying to go upstream. And of course, they build a dam, right? And rather than the, than the salmon going, hey, I can lay my egg right here. Why do I have to go up by that dam? Well, you know why? Because of instinct. And get a load of this guy. He's called... He's called So a button, much less weave. <laughs> and why does he weave that basket instead of just making the regular little nest like all the other birds do? Because God designed them like that. So let me suggest to you that as God created sentient life, that he created four different types of sentient life. Two we're going to talk about today, and two we're going to talk about next week. It says in verse 20, then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and God and, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the, the waters in the sea and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning a fifth day. And so in this section, God creates two of the four kind of animals that we have in our world. And the first one is what you and I would call ocean or water life. 
He says that in Genesis 1 and verse 20, the first part, in verse 21, it says, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the sea. So God says, I'm going to make all these creatures in the oceans. And so God physically created sea creatures. And, and uh, Leroy is really happy about that because he gets to go fishing. And he gets to catch a fish every once in a while if he, does it, if he does it the right way. And God creates all these fish. And you and I like to eat the lobsters and we like to eat the, the, the tuna. And we like to eat all the different kinds of, of animals that are out there that, that we eat. Uh, as individuals. But he also created, if you notice the word is teeming. So he didn't just create the fish. He created the little bitty teeming things, the microscopic things, the variety of sea life. And so I want you to hear somebody uh, who is a really good preacher instead of me, for help a suggestion for you, that the spiritual realm, in the spiritual realm, that the, these, these sea creatures would represent the Gentile world. We've kind of talked about this before with the oceans. In Revelation 3 and verse 13 and verse 1, it says, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. And then I saw a beast come up out of the sea, having ten, ten horns and seven heads, and, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his head were blasphemous names. And in Revelation 17, 15, where it talks about the woman sitting on the beast, uh, it says this in verse 15 of Revelation 17. It says, And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And so in the spiritual world, the ocean and the ocean creatures seem to represent the Gentile world. What I find really interesting is that you never have, in all of the sacrifices that are given, you never have God sacrificing a fish. Have you ever noticed that? In all that list of, of animals and birds that they can sacrifice... There's never a sea creature that they sacrifice. Why is that? Well, I think the idea is because they represent the Gentile world. And, and, and God is not going to be able to use the Gentile world in his efforts. That's why in the stories that we do have about fish and about God, you have to take the fish out of the water and bring it onto land before it becomes useful to God. In Matthew 4, verse 19, when Jesus is talking to Peter and James and they're fishing, and he says to them... Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see, we take people out of the Gentile world and we bring them into God's world, the land, the solid ground that we talked about when God made the dirt. Remember that, that sermon? When God made the dirt and the ground and he made it solid for us to stand on. We've got to bring those people that are in this tumultuous world. And we have to bring them into our world, into this spiritual world where Jesus is the rock and place them upon the rock so that they then can be on solid ground. And then we see Jesus using them in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 47. He even has a little story about that or a parable about that. And that's the parable that goes like this in verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. So he says... My kingdom is like I go out into the sea and I get a drag, then I drag a bunch of fish into the land, and then I separate them to figure out which I'm going to use and which I'm not going to use. But I have to bring them out of their world into solid ground. And I suggest to you that's the spiritual implications there. The second creatures that God made were those creatures of the air, those creatures that were in the air. In verse 20 it says, And let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heaven, and every winged bird after its kind, and God saw that it was good. And so God made all the physical variety of flying creatures that you can think of. And by the way, it doesn't necessarily just mean birds. It means anything that flies. But we're going to look at it from the standpoint of birds. Uh, the word uh, 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 opa means winged in, in, in uh, Hebrew. And so he, he makes from the smallest winged creatures all the way to the largest, and here's the smallest one. Did you know? The winged hummingbird is a species of hummingbird, which is the world's smallest bird. It is an anthocuma. Females weigh 2.6 grams and are 6.1 centimeters long, and are slightly larger than males, with an average weight of 1.95 grams and length of 5.5 centimeters. Like all hummingbirds, it is a swift, strong flyer. Guinness World Records. This video is created and designed by Infokimia PK. My wife on our patio, she hangs this little sugar hummingbird container. And the hummingbirds come and fly. And, and, and I mean, they're not like 
that big. And that hummingbird is even smaller. It's so tiny. God created those winged creatures. He also created the largest birds and the largest winged creatures that you can think of. This is Lucas, the Andean condor. Oh, yes. With wings that spread up to 10 feet apart, the Andean condor is one of the largest flying birds in the world. Found throughout the Andes Mountains, the condor is a national symbol of many South American countries. The condor has a hairless head, which changes color depending on their emotional state. In the male, there is a fleshy crest on the crown of their head, used to attract females. It is also one of the longest living birds, with some condors living for more than 70 years. It is a scavenger bird, traveling over 100 miles a day to find carcasses along the Andes Mountains and sometimes all the way into the South American coast. The condor population is in decline, mostly due to the destruction of its natural habitat, as well as lead poisoning from carcasses shot by hunters. This is the Andean condor. So what do these birds represent as far as the spiritual world goes? Well, let me suggest to you that in Leviticus chapter 14, where God is talking about the cleansing of a leper, he uses birds. In, in Leviticus 14 and verse 6 it says, As for the living bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and the hyssop, and shall dip them, on, uh, dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. He shall then sprinkle seven times the one who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and pronounce him clean, and shall let the live bird go, over, go free over the open field. Why a bird? Because a bird represents a heavenly creature. Leprosy represents sin. And the only way for us to get rid of sin is for a divine heavenly being to come down from where he is to free us from our sins. And then when he does that, when he dies for us, we are allowed to fly into the heavens and be God's people. The Holy Spirit was described as a dove in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And, be, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting upon him. And behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Holy Spirit comes down as a dove that represents this uh, another heavenly individual that comes down, a heavenly individual of peace. And the Holy Spirit brooded, if you remember, in Genesis 1 and verse 2, over the surface of the waters when God first created them. Remember that? In Genesis 1 and verse 2, And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered like that eagle over the surface of the water. And God used the birds to tell you that he cares about you. In Matthew 6 and verse 25 it says, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? So whenever you go out and you see the birds in the air, and you see them flying around, you can, you can say, oh, God's taking care of them. And you know what that means? God's going to take care of me. God's going to take care of us. If he cares about the birds, he cares about us. Because we are more than just sentient life. And he said, and God blessed them and told them to fill the earth. In verse 22 of Genesis 1, it says, God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the sea. And let the birds multiply in the air. And God created them fully developed. God did not just take a little bit of DNA and drop it in our oceans and wait for it to somehow evolve. God designed each and every creature fully developed exactly the way he wanted it when he created it. In Psalms 104 and verse 25 it says, There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals both small and great. God carefully designed each and every creature full grown. By the way, that helps explain how it is that uh, light that takes a hundred billion years to get to us from some other planet or from some other star, when God created the world and us, we can see it. 
Because God didn't create a baby world. God created a full-grown world, just like he didn't create little baby animals. He created them fully grown where they can reproduce and take care of themselves. And he says they reproduce after their kind. In Genesis 1 and verse 21, it says, And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moved with which water swarms after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God said the birds are going to stay birds, the fish are going to stay fish, the squirrels are going to stay squirrels, and Mike's going to stay Mike. <laughs> and God declared that it was good. In Genesis 1 and verse 21, it says God saw that it was good. In verse 23, and there was evening. And there was morning, a fifth day. And so physically, good implies a purpose. So there is a purpose for everything God does. We can see the purpose. Uh, I showed you that little plankton story. Uh, you can see the purpose for the plankton. You can see the purpose for why we need them, why the world needs them, for ecology. That's why we should be careful with our ecology. But we need to make sure not go to the other extreme where we worship nature. But we need to be concerned about our, our ecology because God set it up in a way that it's going to help us and benefit us. So everything God does, he does for a purpose. And what we need to remember is that uh, good implies a purpose. And so spiritually, God has a purpose in all of this also. In Job chapter 12 and verse 7, it says, But now ask the beasts, and let them teach you, and the birds of the heaven, and let them tell you. Or speak to the, to the earth, and let it teach you, and let the fish of the sea declare to you, who among all, those, all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And whose hand is, uh, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? God says, look around at the world. And you're going to see the fingerprint of God everywhere you look. The fruit trees bear fruit because God put it that way. The sea creatures multiply because God put it that way. God designed everything and he put it that way. And God says you should learn something from the earth. And they point us to praise God. In Psalm 115 verse 6 it says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And in, verse, in chapter 33 and verse 6 it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the water of the sea together as a heap, he lays up the depths in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood firm. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't by seeding. It wasn't by some alien race coming and dropping off a little bit of DNA in our water. It was by God who designed every single creature exactly the way he wanted it. Bible faith tells us that God created everything in six days. And God's love provided not only a planet with all we needed, but he used it to focus our attention towards the heavenly realm. If you haven't been baptized in Jesus, we encourage you to do so before it's too late. Because everything, everything points to God. We're going to stand and sing song number 85 to help us remember that we're in God's kingdom. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday's glare? Work will soon.